Welcome to The Next Track, a podcast about how people listen to music today. I'm Doug Adams. And I'm Kirk McElhern. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on The Next Track. You know, I got a note from our social media manager the other day that we're not plugging our Twitter feed enough, and then I remembered I'm the social media manager. So let me just tell you that Next Track Cast, all one word, is our Twitter handle, and we generally tweet articles from around the web about music and music tech or topics and guests that we've had on the podcast. So give us a follow at Next Track Cast. That's all one word. This is episode number 88 of The Next Track, and it is brought to you by Econ Technologies, the makers of ChronoSync backups and sync software. I'm going to be able to tell you some more about ChronoSync a little later in the program, as well as uh, have a special discount offer for you, too. Today, we are happy to have back Chris Conacher of thecomputeraudiofile.com. Chris, how are you? It's great to see you. Great to see you guys. I'm doing great. It feels like I haven't been here for a year. But... Well, you haven't been here since last year, but it, it's been quite a while, and, and I know why you've been really busy. We'll, we'll be talking about your new venture today. It's called Superphonica. It's a platform for people to buy and sell hi-fi equipment, and... The main reason we wanted to get you on was to talk about this process of buying and selling hi-fi equipment. To some of us who don't buy and sell this stuff very often, it seems like it's a very opaque market. It's hard to know what things are worth. It's hard to know how to buy things and not get ripped off. And when you see some of the prices of, of high-end audio, it's hard to know if you're getting your money's worth. So tell us, how does buying and selling high-end hi-fi equipment work these days? Yeah, so there are a number of different models you know for buying and selling and you know the traditional way was there was a hi-fi dealer on every corner well not really but there were a lot of hi-fi dealers and you went down there and see what they had and you read the magazines to find a product you're interested in. you went down there you listened to it and you know you bought it brought it home now there's not a hi-fi dealer within 500 miles for a lot of people so uh, what they do is you know they read online for what to buy and a lot of the people that I talk to are really frustrated with the buying experience. And when you're looking at spending tens of thousands of dollars for expensive hi-fi, you feel like that experience should be a really pleasant one. You know, if you're handing over a check for that much money. Um, the traditional hi-fi dealer does not have the best reputation. And for a lot of them, that's... That's what they deserve, not the best reputation. They like to just ship boxes and they would drop ship if they could from a manufacturer. And when it comes to supporting the product, they say, yeah, contact the manufacturer. So they made 50%, 40% margin, and they've done really nothing for you. So that, that has led to a lot of frustration from buyers. But there are also awesome dealers in Hi-Fi that most people don't talk about um, because most people don't know them. They're tiny shops. And they will literally overnight you a product, you know, without really knowing you too much to try it in your house. Try it till you get sick of it, you know, stuff like that. And, and, and let you return it if you don't like it. Oh, totally. Yeah. The level of service is over the top. It's unmatched in any industry. But finding those people is very hard. They're few and far between. And if it's a one person shop, he can't service the whole United States or the whole world. It's, it's impossible. The range from... A terrible experience to a great experience is wide, and finding you know, the balance or the right one that fits for you is difficult, too. I, I remember back in the day, I, I grew up in New York, and, and there was almost a hi-fi shop on every corner when you went into Manhattan. There were certain neighborhoods where they were all over the place. You'd go to 47th Street, where you'd get all the photo shops and the hi-fi shops and the guitar shops, and you could buy this stuff easily. I remember Crazy Eddie back in the day. And obviously, this isn't the same type of hi-fi equipment. You know, this is low-end consumer-grade equipment that they were selling. You're talking about here high-end equipment that's much more expensive. So for years, I kind of, you know, I'm, I, I'm not of your audiophile ilk, and I've never really gone out of my way to keep upgrading my equipment. But a few years ago, I lived in a town called Gap in France. The last year I was in France, and I wanted to upgrade my stuff, and I found one of these little shops two or three people, and they did TVs, and they did stereos, and they had a listening room, and they took a lot of time, and they let me try a bunch of different speakers to find what I wanted and try amplifiers, and it was a good experience. It was really quite good, but I think that this sort of dealer today is an awful lot like computer dealers. They just can't make a living anymore because there aren't enough people who are buying product from them. You know, back in the day, you'd buy a computer. 
they'd sell you maybe Microsoft Office and some utilities and some peripherals, a printer, a scanner, but that doesn't happen anymore. Is it the same in Hi-Fi? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. It is tough to make a living and have employees and pay health insurance, you know, to have a business. That's why the dealers I know that offer the best service are one man or two man shops with maybe a contractor that helps them out once in a while. It is just, it's, it's very hard. And, you know, for what, for whatever reason, there are many reasons why people aren't, you know, buying high end high fi or whatever anymore. But yeah, it's very hard. Th that was going to be my next question. Do we know how many people are buying this sort of equipment compared to 30 years ago when Doug and I were growing up, we were a little bit older than you. Everyone had to have a stereo system in their house. It was an essential thing. Now, today, you just need a Bluetooth speaker, and that satisfies most people. Has has the high end eroded as much as the sort of middle to low end of stereo ownership? Yeah. Uh, you know, in the industry, we talk about this a lot and how to bring more people in because people are disappearing. And some people say, well, the high end has kind of abandoned the middle class. And the middle class presumably is a very large population. So the the middle class can't afford it. So they're not going to be into this hobby anymore. And then the manufacturers say, well, the middle class abandoned us. So we're only making what sells and this is what's selling. There's there's no easy answer, but I know we had a Christmas party here and I had little nephews over. I say little, 10 years old, nine years old. And I brought them down to my listening room and they went, okay, cool. Do you got an Xbox? <laughs> <laughs> there's just so many other competing things now sure. that you know they compete for time and what's most interesting. Yeah, I think you're mentioning the middle class is quite interesting. There was an article in the New Yorker this week by David Denby who was talking about his audiophilia. And he said something at the end of the article, which is actually the first time I've seen this in print. He said that buying audiophile equipment is a luxury pursuit. And this is something that audiophiles don't like to say because I think luxury is, is a bit pejorative. It, it sounds like excess. On the other hand, I, I read stereophile. I have this thing called Readly. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's a it's a subscription service. I pay eight pounds a month and I can get like 500 magazines and they have stereophile and sound and music. So I've been keeping up on the, the audio stuff through that. And stereophile, there's an ad for this turntable, which is one of these multi-level turntables on these pillars and it's $40,000. And I, I find it hard to accept that this industry is trying to broaden the base and and maybe this is just the natural progression of an industry that is is slowly contracting because fewer people are interested. So the only way they can make the money is by selling the high end stuff. Yeah. And I kind of look at it as possibly right sizing. There are so many manufacturers out there chasing, you know, the same limited amount of customers. So unfortunately, some of them are going to have to go away. You can't survive. And yes, they are making the products that are going to keep them afloat. And, you know, and it's weird too, in this industry, a lot of the manufacturers are very small shops founded by guys who are ultra smart, double E's geeks into audio, and they build what's interesting to them. So building a $500 turntable may not be interesting to them. So they're going for here's the best I can do. And you know what? It's going to cost $40,000. So be it. And voila, it's selling great. It's it's a weird industry, though. But when you say selling great, what does that mean? Do you have any idea of, uh, not, not specific articles and specific numbers, but when someone makes a product like that, how many units can they expect to sell? Yeah, uh, that's something... That they don't want to tell you. True. And it's all over the board, too. One $40,000 turntable manufacturer might sell one of them, and a competitor selling $100,000 turntables might sell 10 of them. It's it's just all over the board and it's who you talk to and who's gonna be honest. Is a manufacturer gonna tell me as a member of the press, I only sold one of these in the last three years? Probably not. not. No, they, they'd be like Amazon who doesn't release sales figures for Kindles. Even, even though we know they're selling millions, they don't want anyone to know how many millions there are. And, and in the case of the $40,000 turntable, it would be embarrassing if, there's, if they've only sold three and if they have sold 100, you'd probably know about it because they'd be driving Jaguars. Which brings up another thing. You don't get in this industry to get rich. That's for sure. There are sure there's a couple manufacturers who have done well and say got rich, but most of them, absolutely not. It's it's a passion. And, and that's a bit of a paradox because 
obviously not everything costs forty thousand dollars i mentioned earlier you've got a pair of monoblock amplifiers on superphonica at twelve thousand five hundred i mean that's still getting toward the high end a lot of the stuff you're selling on your site is two three four thousand dollars it's still for customers with a, a fair amount of disposable income is is it really possible that the customers are doing better than the manufacturers oh yes definitely i know some manufacturers who are selling very inexpensive stuff i've talked to to competing manufacturers saying hey look at these guys they're doing awesome and the response is well i'm worried about them i don't know that they can stay in business so you mentioned earlier about some of these dealers who just sell things and you said they get like a 40 or 50 percent margin is that the standard margin that a a, a retailer is going to get so it depends on the product but i would say 40 percent 50 percent is standard probably more towards 40 but if it's loudspeakers it's usually 50 components 40 and if it's sonos maybe it's 15 you know it, it all depends but for real high-end products it is about that and it frustrates both the consumer and the manufacturer when they have dealers who just ship boxes and don't really support the customer. And it's really, really critical when it comes to computer audio. If you have a music server and, you know, the customer plugs it in and he can't find it on his network. Yeah, you, you need a phone number you can call to get support to help you set it up. Yes. And 99% of the time, this is a problem with the customer's network. Yes. And for the manufacturer, say, who's in South Korea, to help with this in whatever time zone difference they are from the consumer... It's, it's a pain for everybody, and it's less service than the consumer deserves. So it is a point of frustration, I think, for everybody. While the dealer, maybe he's, also, maybe he's older, doesn't understand the stuff, it's still no excuse, but he's just made 40% on that sale and really isn't offering any service than, other than to say, here's the manufacturer, contact them, they have great support. So if the dealer is making 40 or 50%, What's the manufacturer getting after their expenses? So let's let's say a five thousand dollar amplifier. If the dealer is selling it for twenty five hundred, how much does it cost the manufacturer to make it? In my understanding, it's usually like a about a doubling every time it changes hands. Right. So okay. the manufacturer will sell it for double to the dealer. Dealer will sell it for double to the consumer. And if there's distribution in there, you can count another, another. doubling. Obviously, in some cases, the numbers are a little loose there, but that's generally how it works. Or, you know, some manufacturers will say, well, we have a five times the cost of parts. That's our multiplier. It's five times or eight times or 10 times. You know, it's when you look at the final price, you're like, gosh, somebody's making a killing here. <laughs> yeah, but uh, OK, so I, I've been in the publishing and book industry and I know how each step adds more expenses. You can't ignore the fact that there's R and D involved for the manufacturer. There's marketing. There's, uh, you know, there might even be patents for some of them. So there's a, there's a whole lot more than just the cost of the parts. And, I, and I'm not defending someone who sells a forty thousand dollar turntable, but you can't just, uh, you know, the the way every time a new iPhone comes out, some websites will say, well, all the parts cost this, but that's not the cost of the device. You know, you've got everything. You've got the infrastructure. You've got the packaging. You've got the transport. You're transporting the goods. You've got taxes. You've got salaries. So and think about it. What if Apple sold 100 iPhones a year? How much that product would cost? I mean, their buying power would be zero. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be about two or three million a year if to make the same amount of money that they make on you know the the 200 million or whatever that they sell. Yeah. Yeah, um, the economies so, of scale just are not here for hi-fi. Yeah, and, and I guess that's one of the problems that separates some of this high-end stuff from, let's say, the mid-range stuff. Is it possible, however, that some of the mid-range stuff made in larger quantities is just as good as some of the high-end stuff that's made in a, in a small artisanal shop because of this economy of scale? Absolutely. It can be just as good or better. You know, you're not, and, and depending on what your definition of good is, some people are only after the most, the best sound quality they can get. You know, the most authentic, not change anything. And that definition of good is, you know, definitely different than the guy who wants something that is very unique. There's exclusivity with it. It was handmade by a guy in an yes, Italian shop. Point. So yeah. in terms of performance, though, and if you're going to listen, you can absolutely get better, equal or worse performance at much lower prices. Like 
you can probably see behind me, I have a shit audio system. That is S-C-H-I-T-T for the listeners out there who thought that we should have to put an explicit tag on this podcast episode. Yes. And that stuff is incredibly inexpensive compared to most stuff in hi-fi. Yet still, like the amplifiers behind me, each one is, I think, around $700. And if I told my mom she was going to need to buy $700 amplifiers, she would probably look at me like I had an eye in my forehead. You know, so it's still expensive. But relatively, yeah. yeah. And it's like not even the cost of sales tax for some of this other stuff. And the performance you'll get out of it is awesome. So so this is interesting. And this should be another episode. We'll, we'll maybe talk about this at one point. Because um, in the audiophile world, there is this search for exclusivity for the latest thing, for the best thing and all that. Um, and you managed to sort of straddle both sides of the argument here. Um, being more than happy to talk about the really high-end stuff, but also being extremely down-to-earth when you point out that less expensive equipment can sound just as good. Why are so many audiophiles unwilling to take that step and to say the shit audio system is just as good as the $20,000 amplifier? I I've thought about that a lot, and I see the conversations a lot on the forum and stuff like that, and I think a lot of it is fear-based. What if they say the $700 amplifier is as good as a $40,000 amplifier, does the hobby go away? You know, do, if they're a publisher, does all my advertising go away? You know, if you keep the status quo, you just know how it's going to work. It, who knows, it may be better if we all said the $700 amplifier is way better. If, if everyone said that and they thought that to be the case, wow, just think of the larger audience we could have. Indeed, the, the larger audience and, and the less of a feeling of this sort of being kept out of a, a secret club in a certain way. It's interesting. So a while ago, I wanted to upgrade the amplifier in my office, and we had Andy Doe on. We talked about how one goes about buying an amplifier. And so I did buy an amplifier, and we'll probably do another show about that, about the result of this. But on your forum, I was asking some people about it, and when I mentioned the brand, someone replied, Sniff, that's a lifestyle brand. I didn't realize that lifestyle was an insult in the audiophile world, but I have since learned that this is the case. As if a, a lifestyle brand, let's call it a consumer brand, it's a Yamaha amplifier, and, and you've said many good things about Yamaha products in the past, as if for some reason it is an inferior product to whatever $10,000 amplifier the guy has. Yes, that's the old guard. Those guys... Just, you know, again, I think it's fear-based. If, oh, that's a lifestyle product, it can't be that good. Or what's going to happen if, is my hobby going to disappear if lifestyle products all of a sudden take over? You know, it just, it's the old guard. It makes no sense to me. It keeps them happy. I just think, you know, if you're buying Yamaha or whatever, it can perform awesome. So stop the nonsense about calling something lifestyle. But on the same token, the reverse is true of the word audiophile shouldn't be a pejorative. You know, people who want the best sound, why is that a bad thing? Certainly there are extremes in the hobby that we would all look at and go, wow, that, that's crazy. But so be it. It's like that with anything. Yeah, right. Can we just pause for about a minute here and we'll get back to some more about buying and selling new and used hi-fi gear. And we'll also talk about Chris's new venture, Superphonica. As regular listeners know, we are both big on backups. I mean, even if you're just using Time Machine, that's a good thing. But there are many situations where you may want more than Time Machine's one-trick pony, and that's why you should have a look at Chronosync from Econ Technologies. Chronosync is a superior backup and file synchronization app. You can use it to do backups to and from any mounted volume or server. In fact, anything you can mount as a volume can be used for backups. Of course, Chronosync is ready for High Sierra and the new APFS file system. And there's a couple of things that I really like about Chronosync. First, you can do some really fancy scheduling once a day, once a week, monthly, or any combination. You can schedule different scheduling tasks at different times. And you can trigger backups based on file system activity. For instance, you could use Chronosync to back up a particular folder when the files you're working on have changed. Say you're working on a big video project or a huge CAD file. It's a breeze to make incremental backups while you work. And I say it's a breeze because Chronosync has a terrific setup assistant that simply asks what you want to do, when you want to do it, and then bam, you're done. Chronosync does so much more than I have time to talk about here, like drive cloning, 
bootable system backups, syncing iTunes libraries, I highly recommend downloading the 15-day trial to see how it can fit into your workflow. In fact, because you're an Extract listener, when you decide to purchase Chronosync, you can save 25%. Now, here's what you do. You go to this episode's page at thenexttrack.com. This is episode number 88. And click the link there that takes you to the Chronosync page. And the 25% savings will be yours. Whatever your backup or sync scenario, Chronosync has got you covered. Download the full-featured 15-day trial of Chronosync today at econtechnologies.com. And we thank them for being a sponsor of the next track. Great software. So it seems to me that a lot of the people who you're talking about here are people who do spend a lot of time buying new equipment and eventually selling their older equipment to upgrade, to go from one thing to another. I see this with cameras. I'm a, a bit of a camera buff and, and, and people will buy a camera and a couple of lenses and then they'll buy the next camera, sell the previous one. How much of a sort of upgrade ladder is there for a lot of audiophiles? There is an endless upgrade ladder. And for some people that is part of the fun. You bring in some components and you love the sound. You got maybe got tubes on your amplifier this time. And then after a while, you want something different. And the beauty is you can sell it and buy something new. It's, you know, you don't have it forever. And when you're talking stuff that is fairly expensive, it's just difficult to put that on the shelf and say, okay, I'm going to invest full price into this next thing and have money sitting on the table. But yeah, part of this hobby for some people, it is I want to buy one system and I never want to change it. For others, it's this continual path of it's a journey and that's part of the fun for them. And I look at both of them as equally okay. You know, I, some people will look at people who continually upgrade with, a, you know, a negative viewpoint. And I'm like, well, why, do, why should you care? That's their hobby. That's what they do. And if that brings them enjoyment and fun, you know, so be it. What, what kind of price can you get? Let's take a $10,000 amplifier. A year old, how much can you get used roughly? Roughly, I think most people start at 50%. But it also depends on the manufacturer. If it's a very exclusive manufacturer with has really high resale value, I think you can look at the same when it comes to like cars. If I'm selling my Honda that's from 2003, it's going to bring me more than a 2003 Kia. Because back in the day, Kias were not built as well. So, or they didn't have the reputation, even if they were. So, right. you know, it's all manufacturer reputation and if certain products don't last from certain manufacturers or, you know, there's all kinds of things. But I think generally people start off with 50%. And I've sold some audio equipment on eBay and I've never had a problem. How safe is it to buy? And see, here I am, I've sold stuff and I know that my stuff was good, but what about other people's? How safe is it to buy on eBay? So I have a quote on the new site, you know, from Abraham Lincoln. I bought it online. It must be good. <laughs> <laughs> So you've set up a new platform called Superphonica for buying and selling hi-fi equipment. Tell us why you did this. I did this for a number of reasons. First, I want to expand my publishing platform on computer audio file. I want to be able to hire more writers. I want to be able to hire good writers. I want measuring equipment so we can measure this stuff that we get in for people who are interested. Or I want to be able to have an outside lab measure the stuff. And I'm not, I don't believe in getting stuff for free. I could ask people, can you measure this for me? Or can you write an article for me? I just, I, I don't like that. So I want to be able to afford to do this. And so how am I going to do that? I could raise ad rates. I could do all kinds of things. And then I thought, you know, I've wanted for a while to create a marketplace as well. So there's disruption to, to be done in this area. And there's definitely better services to offer people. So I thought this is kind of the marriage of something I've wanted to do and something that can help bring the publishing platform further. Yet your fee is relatively low. It's just 1%. I guess on a $40,000 turntable, that comes out to a lot of money, though. Yeah, but our maximum is $349. So True. we're looking at this like what stops people from listing stuff and selling it? Because I know a lot of people who have stuff sitting in their basement, just like ah, it's too difficult to sell or I don't like the fees or, you know, whatever. And we thought, how do we make this easy for people and offer a reasonable price for the services offered? I don't want to gouge people because I hate getting gouged. So we said, let's just charge people 1%, maximum $349. And we don't like the grandfather's classifieds where if you want to bold it, that's an extra 250. Or you get into the middle of listing your product 
And by the time you're done, you've spent $40 on, do you want a larger picture? Do you want this? Do you want that? I'm just like, I don't like that. So I don't want people to have that experience on a site that I put my name on. Granted, it's probably good business because a lot of other sites do it, but we're looking at this as a marathon, not a sprint. This is a long-term thing. We're not throwing this site at the wall to see if it sticks. This is a platform that took us months to build and come up with this. So we think 1%, that's good. If we're bringing the buyer and seller together, 1% is fine with us. Yes, we'd like it to be 20%, but that's ridiculous. And and this is both for professional hi-fi dealers and individuals to buy and sell, correct? Yes. When I thought about that, I was like, okay, if I'm searching for a new DAC and I know the model I want, say I'm looking for Berkeley Audio Design Alpha DAC, and I search for it on Superphonica, oh, there's a new one and there's a used one right there in the search results. I thought, what could be better? You know, if I didn't previously think to search for used, well, then I would only look at new or, you know, vice versa. Now I can see both. I can see the price and I can decide which one works for me. And if those DACs have sold in the past on our site, the prices of all of them will be out there and they'll, they'll be marked sold. So you can see, am I getting a fair price for the used one if I buy it? Or, you know, is am I going to wait? Or I'll just take the new one. So that's kind of my thinking was, how would I like to see this? I want both in one spot. You know, you mentioned you're a camera guy too, or, you know, a photographer. So I shop at B&H a lot. And they split the new and the used into what seems to be totally different websites. Yeah. And when I'm searching, I'm like, oh, do they have this used? I got to click over to the used side. And I don't like the separation. Obviously, it works for them, and it's a decision they made. But... I prefer everything the same. Like I was looking for that new Sony a7R3, which seems yeah. to be a very cool camera. And granted, they're not going to have any use, but it would have been cool to see new and used show what up. What the price is of a used. Yeah. Or, or if you really want to dump some money on a Leica, it'd be interesting to see what kind of price you could get a used one for instead of foraging for a new one. Yes. Or if you have one you want to sell, hey, let's that see too. what they're all have sold for. To know for. what it's worth. Yeah. There yeah. We go. So a lot of these camera stores, they will buy back your equipment if you buy something from them, but it's good to have an idea of what they're selling it for because they're going to buy it back for about half, maybe two thirds of, of what they're selling it for. And that gives you a little bit more information and information is power. And what you're describing on Superphonica is really great information for the buyer, but I guess the sellers aren't that happy. Sellers have asked, can you get rid of the price once I sell something? <laughs> yeah. And our response is absolutely not. That's... That's like reverse progress to us. You know, the technology yeah. allows us to leave it all out there forever. We're going to leave it out there. And, and that's the case on eBay. You can look at sold listings. The only problem with eBay is that you'll see the sold price for an auction. And if something was not on auction and it was sold with a best offer, you won't see the, the offer that was accepted. You'll see the initial listing price. So you won't know exactly how much it sells for. But when it's an auction, and, and particularly if it's a product that sells a lot, you can check the auction prices to have a good idea of what you can get for your own or what you'd be paying for a similar item. And that kind of brings up another thing, too, is we don't do auctions. We don't do this 30-day limited. To me, that brings up anxiety, and it yeah. brings up I have to do something in 30 days if X doesn't happen or if it doesn't sell. I need to relist. So our thing is, you know what? Put it up there. If you want it up there for 15 days, fine. If you want it up there for a year, fine. But it just takes any sort of anxiety or future, you need to do something off the table. So what about security for both buyers and sellers? Some of these items are relatively expensive. How are they protected when they buy through your site? Absolutely, that was critical to us because we just put ourselves in those shoes. You know, I don't want to take risks. I don't want to get screwed. So. We have the standard PayPal. You can buy through PayPal and you get all the protections included with PayPal. Everybody's pretty familiar with that. But we also worked super close with a company called escrow.com. A lot of people aren't familiar with them. They kind of made their name through buying and selling domains. Like I believe Uber was bought and sold through escrow.com. And if you know anything about domains, you can't just sign over your domain to somebody on the promise that they'll pay because once it's signed over, it's gone. Right. So we worked very closely with escrow to integrate their platform into our site. So how escrow works, it's so cool. You buy something. So as the buyer, you send your payment to escrow.com. Once they receive it, they tell the seller, hey, we have the payment. It's all good. You can send your goods to them. 
the buyer receives it, says, okay, yep, everything's good. Then escrow releases the payment to the seller. It's awesome. And their thing too is no chargebacks ever. They take the hit. So they take the risk and their fees are lower than PayPal. Wow. Okay. I know they work with eBay in the U.S., but not outside of the U.S. So if you are selling something relatively expensive through eBay, you can use them like for artworks or you know, expensive hi-fi equipment. You can use them with eBay. That's one thing we saw is yeah, eBay Motors says, you know, use escrow for payment. Right. And we wanted to take it a step further rather than say, yeah, we recommend you use escrow. We wanted it built into our platform. So when you check out and you select escrow, this transaction is automatically created for you on escrow.com. Your username, everything is all set up. So you log in and it's, oh, how do you want to pay the guy? You know, wire transfer, PayPal, whatever. And we wanted to take it a step further. So yeah, we love escrow. Uh, it's it's just the coolest thing. So browsing your site, not everything is $12,500. There are people selling headphones and here's one that's got a headphone stand and here's one that's selling a, a headphone amplifier for 1000 a speaker for 350 So it's not all high-end equipment. Yeah, very true. I mean, it could be anything, but I like to think it's all high-performance equipment. There's like, I'm looking now at a pair of Magna, Magnapan speakers for $585, very difficult to ship. But if you've ever heard Magnapan speakers, they are awesome. Some of the best speakers ever. So that for less than 600 bucks is an incredible deal. Well, anyone who's interested, check out superphonica.com, link in the show notes, of course. Chris, we wish you all the best because this really is a good idea to create this platform to consolidate all of these buyers and sellers. And, and I really think over time, this is going to prove very popular in, in part because, as you said, you're listing new and used, you're keeping price history, and it, it's going to be a lot more transparent than what we know today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. We just we want to bring buyers and sellers together. And sometimes manufacturers selling direct is the best. Other times it's not. So we offer both. Great. Thanks, Chris, for joining us again. Thank you. Before we present our next tracks, we want to thank Econ Technologies, the makers of ChronoSync Backup and Sync Software, for sponsoring this episode. You can download a full-featured 15-day trial of ChronoSync today at econtechnologies.com and then save 25% on ChronoSync. Just go to the episode number 88 page at thenexttrack.com. Click the link that takes you to the ChronoSync website. All right, Kurt, what's your next track? My next track this week is Lou Reed's 1982 album, The Blue Mask. Now, when you look at Lou Reed's career, he reinvented himself a number of times, kind of like David Bowie did. You know, after the Velvet Underground stopped, he came out with the Transformer album. And then Street Hassle was a big deal in, in 1978. And then in 1982, the Blue Mask was a, a slightly new direction. And he had his ups and downs. But this was one of the most powerful albums he released post Velvet Underground. And, and it, it's a pretty raucous album. The title track, which is the first one, I believe on side two, I'm, I'm looking at the CD listing and I can't remember what it was on the LPs. It was either the first track on side two or the last one on side one. It's a loud track. It's very loud and it's got some really rocking guitar. Robert Quine plays guitar and it just gave this album an extraordinary sound. Fernando Saunders on bass is, is a magnificent performer. I, I saw Lou perform around this time at the bottom line in New York. If you don't remember the bottom line, it was his cabaret and you could basically sit, you know, two feet from the stage. And it was great in this tiny stage to see Lou, who really projected power and energy in this little space. It's got some good songs. It's got some songs that aren't as good. The, the Blue Mask is great. Heavenly Arms. The Day John Kennedy Died is interesting. Waves of Fear, Average Guy. And a couple of them aren't that good. One about alcohol underneath the bottle, etc. But it's, you know, like a lot of Lou Reed albums, it's not perfect. It's got good songs and it's got mediocre songs but this really was a period when he came back from a couple of years of of not doing anything great to to just give a real kick to the music world so it's called the blue mask 1982 by lou reed what about you doug maybe you have heard of the remains they were a uh, a popular band in boston and the new england area during the 1960s they're essentially a garage rock bar band but they became so popular that they actually managed to get a three-week gig with the Beatles during their 1966 tour. The sad thing for the Remains is, though, that their drummer quit while they were backing up the Beatles. And even though they got another drummer, it was just never the same. And they broke up shortly after that. And they only released one album. Even so, they were legendary in the Boston area and occasionally would get together and do you know one-off nights, sometimes known as Barry and the Remains. 
when the seventies rolled around and the 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 punk and garage rock uh, revival happened, they also were rediscovered by a, a lot of people in the Northeast. In fact, I often wonder if the Ramones decided to name themselves after the remains. But anyway, to make this long story a little shorter, there has been a recording found that they did at one of these one-off gigs uh, in 1969 at the Boston Tea Party, which is a club that uh, I've mentioned in the past. Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac did a, uh, a live recording there. This recording, uh, it's I haven't listened to the whole thing yet. Uh, I only listened to the first song. It's a cover of Hang On Sloopy. There are a lot of covers from that era uh, on this recording. And you might think, oh, hang on, Sloopy, that's going to be pretty wimpy. But these guys really tear it up. I mean, they are the quintessential garage rock band. It's a lousy recording, and it's lousy musicianship, and it's really great. <laughs> so I, I can't wait to really listen to the rest of it. It is The Remains, live, 1969, and it's my next track. This has been The Next Track, a podcast about how people listen to music today. You can find show notes and links to some of the things we talked about in this and other episodes at thenexttrack.com. There's also a contact form there you can use to send us comments. If you like the show, we hope you'll subscribe in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And please think about giving us a review or rating. We'd appreciate that. I'm Doug Adams, and for Kirk McElhern, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.